In previous years I was invited by the Panzer Museum Munster and the Tank Museum at Bovington. Yes, I have to mention this to the Austrian laws. In this video we'll look at the Leopard 1, the potential sale to Ukraine and in what way the Ukrainian forces could use the Leopard 1. We are aware that this script was written on the 14th of April 2022 and as such details on the sale discussion likely will be outdated. The other parts should stay relevant, so ideally use the chapter system. Last minute addition here, on the 15th April 2022, the German Chancellor agreed to 2 billion euro as military support for Ukraine, of which 0.4 billion euro should be used for weapons. No mention of the Leopards or any other equipment so far. Let us look at the political situation briefly. On 11th April 2022, the chairman of Rheinmetall mentioned that the first Leopard 1s could be delivered in about 6 weeks to Ukraine, yet that it requires the approval of the German government. In total, such a deal would involve 50 Leopard 1s being delivered in a time span of about 3 months. According to ZDF, the company FFG has another 100 Leopard 1 in storage. The German foreign minister noted that Ukraine requires military material, particularly heavy weapons. Meanwhile, the German chancellor was reluctant. Recently, Germany had approved the sale of Czech BMP 1s to Ukraine, as outlined in this video, that also explains why it had to be approved by Germany. It also shows the little odyssey these BMP 1s have behind them. Although the German leadership in parts is reluctant, the German public seems to be in favor. According to polls in Germany from 11th to 13th April 2022, among 5,000 people, in total about 43% are strongly approving of delivering heavy weapons, so military aircraft, tanks and warships, to Ukraine. 13% are mildly approving, 9% are undecided, 7% are mildly disapproving and 28% are strongly disapproving. We also have data for this along the affiliation of German voters. Here the Green Party supporters are leading with 76% in favor, while 15% are against. For the Social Democrats, the Liberals and the Conservatives, the approval rates are 62, 62 and 59% respectively. Meanwhile, the supporters of the right-wing populist party Alternative for Germany are mostly against it, with 80% disapproving and only 17% for it. The left-wing party, the left, is not trailing far behind, with 64% disapproving and 29% approving. Note that the undecided people are not specifically mentioned in the percentages here. Be aware there is also another study with slightly different values, but for some odd reason it did not include data on the left-wing party. Thank you to Andrew for pointing that out. Let us look at some general information about the Leopard 1. It is old, serious production started in 1965 and it was used in the Bundeswehr until 2003. Historically, the Leopard 1 was used by a lot of NATO countries, nowadays only Greece and Turkey operate them. Greece has about 500 and Turkey about 400. Although there are various countries that still use vehicles on the Leopard 1 chassis as well, like recovery vehicles. For some, that might mean outright dismissal of this tank, but as so often, it's a bit more complicated than that. First, a tank is better than no tank. Yes, a tank can be killed by an anti-tank guided missile, but soldiers operating an anti-tank guided missile can be killed by a machine gun. This does not mean soldiers are obsolete. For a more detailed look on the end of the tank, see my video on this topic. Second, the Leopard over the course of its lifetime received many upgrades. Of particular importance here are the upgrades to the fire control system, which will be discussed in the firepower section. Be aware there were a total of 6 major production batches of the Leopard 1 and a total of 4 major Kampfwertsteigerungen, literally combat value enhancements, sometimes also called modernization programs. The latter were not always universally applied. For brevity, sanity and simplicity, we will assume a fully upgraded Leopard 1 A5. After all, Rheinmetall noted it would need about 5 weeks to make at least 10 tanks operational. It can be assumed that they kept the most modern variants in storage and or apply the latest upgrades to them. Let us look at firepower. The Leopard 1 is equipped with the British 105L7 gun that a lot of NATO tanks used. It was a great gun for its time, now it is a bit outdated. In short, 105mm, not great, not terrible. In terms of ammunition, the Leopard 1 should have APFSDS, which is short for armor piercing fin stabilized discarding zapper. 
These are arrow-shaped projectiles with a high penetration capability for its caliber. The newest one seems to be the DM-63 round, which is produced by Israel and more commonly known as the M-426. The next one are heat shells, which means high explosive anti-tank. These shells create a metal jet that have a very high penetration capability against regular steel. Although particularly Russian tanks are equipped with a lot of explosive reactive armor that is particularly intended to defeat heat shells. You've probably seen those little boxes or sometimes larger boxes on the turret of Russian tanks. That is explosive reactive armor. Finally, against weakly armored targets, the Leopard 1 also has hash, high explosive squash head ammo. According to the protective levels of various T72 variants given by Saloga against AP, FSDS, and heat, the modern front of the T-72s can't be penetrated by any of these projectiles. This is also the case for the T-80 and T-90 as well. Additionally, all other major tanks in the Ukraine were currently equipped with the 125mm guns that are more powerful, so the Ukrainian T-64 and the Russian T-72, T-80 and T-90. As such, the Leopard 1 can't deal with any of these tanks from the front unless it gets a lucky hit or there's some seriously improved ammo provided. Yet, although the gun is dated, the fire control system was upgraded. The laser rangefinder gave a fast and more precise acquisition capability, thus reducing the time lapse to open fire considerably with the corresponding far higher first round hit capability. The new fire control system, aside from the laser distance, also incorporated factors such as temperature of the propellant, air temperature, air pressure, side wind, system malfunction, and position of the vehicle. The fire control computer enabled the gunner to keep his reticle on the center of the target independently from type of ammunition, ballistic factors or speed of the moving target. Lead angle and elevation were given by the computer automatically, thus aligning the gun autonomously. Particularly interesting here are statements from the military historian and former Leopard 1 driver Jens Wehner. You might know him from some of my videos. On his private Twitter account, he noted that he learned to fire and drive in about six weeks. Even more interesting is the following statement. In training battles against modern Leopard 2A4 and 2A5, we had good chances, especially at short combat distances. Hence, the Leopard 1 should be still effective if used under the right circumstances, and so far the Ukrainian forces have pulled off various feats with their sometimes limited capabilities. Another aspect related to firepower but not only are thermal sites. Although I must add here this part I could not find a conclusive answer at all. Historically the Russians had some problems here. In comparison to NATO tanks, Russian tanks of the early 1990s suffered from the slow arrival of thermal imaging gunners night sites. Thermal imaging sites required cryogenic cooling and an advanced focal place array that post mass production difficulties and a substantial increase in cost over the previous generation of image intensification night sites. A thermal imaging site in this era could easily add a quarter million dollars to the cost of the tank. Of course, this was a few decades ago. Technically, the active tanks of the Russian armed forces should have all thermal sites from what I looked up. But as you can see from the list, there's quite some variety. Additional systems vary between the tanks, and I have no good source on comparing the different thermal systems. Finally, the question is how well maintained and functional these systems are. As such, this could mean that the Leopard 1 might have a benefit with its thermal side, but it could also be the other way around. I suspect that against certain Russian tanks, the Leopard 1 system might be better and in some cases it might be worse. In any way, the Ukrainian forces likely know that. Let us look at armor protection next. This is the weakest part of the Leopard 1. Rolf Hilmes notes, in the design philosophy for the Leopard 1 Kampfpanzer, a conscious decision had been made in 1956 to abandon the race between protection and ammunition effectiveness, giving the Leopard 1 relatively modest armor protection initially. The hull is regular steel, not composite armor. Later there were some armor upgrades, but generally those won't make much of a difference against tank guns from the Russian tanks. They had on armor, although included special shock mounts that should reduce damage from auto cannon fire that might damage sensors, vision devices, and other important equipment. Next is mobility. This was one of the strengths of the Leopard 1, but it is quite old. The 1A5 has a horsepower to metric ton ratio of 19.5. In comparison, the T80BV has 25.15 horsepower per metric ton. 
When it comes to the T-72, which is the most numerous tank in the Russian Federation, it depends on the variant. But generally the Leopard is on the lower end here. Of course, the ratio is not everything. Here is a video of a T-72 racing against the Leopard 1, where the Leopard 1 wins. But then again, I don't know which exact variant of the T-72 this is, nor how well maintained, driven, etc. these tanks were in the video. As such, we can assume that the Leopard 1 is likely only comparable to the weaker T-72s in the Russian army in terms of mobility. Yet the Leopard 1 should not be a match for the T-72s upgraded with the stronger engines, nor the T-80s and T-90s. Of course, it could be that some features of the Leopard 1 in regards to mobility that I'm not aware of and or maintenance issues on the Russian side that influence this factor as well. Finally, let us touch briefly on what I would call a soft feature. If we look at the height differences between the Leopard 1 and the T-72, there's a major difference. The height to roof is 2.39 meters for the Leopard 1 and 2.90 meters for the T-72. The Soviet design philosophy was generally to keep tanks as small as possible to provide a small target. This was in parts achieved by rather small areas for the crew, but also by the use of autoloaders. For instance, the T-72 has only a three-man crew since there is no loader whereas US and German tanks generally have a four-man crew. The oddities of Soviet tank design in the 1960s led to a host of standard tanks that were substantially smaller and lighter than their NATO counterparts. The combat-laden T-72M1 weighted 41.5 tons compared to 56.8 tons for the M1A1, thus being one-third lighter. One of the most immediate results of this was the amount of internal space for the crew. One could argue that the additional space in the Leopard 1 just makes it a bigger target and considering that it is rather weakly armored in general, that it makes the Leopard 1 even weaker. Meanwhile, others might argue that due to the more space for the crew, the Leopard 1 is better suited for prolonged combat operations than the T-72s, since it is less cramped. Considering this information, what could be the employment options for the Leopard 1 in Ukrainian service? Let us shortly summarize the strength and weaknesses of the Leopard. It is a decently mobile tank with weak armor and limited firepower. Yet it is definitely better armed and protected than infantry fighting vehicles like the BMP-2 or armored personnel carriers like the BTR-80. The firepower is enhanced by a modern fire control system, which is complemented by its mobility and should allow the Leopard 1 to move in quickly, engage an enemy and leave. In terms of ergonomics, the Leopard 1 should allow for prolonged deployment time. This could be key in various encounters, although it really depends on the situation. About the Ukrainian forces, we know that they have a very good understanding of their terrain. During the fighting in the last weeks, they also learned a decent amount about the limits and capabilities of Russian equipment, troops and tactics. Furthermore, they are highly motivated. In terms of intelligence, tactical intelligence is supported by the drones, additionally also provided with intelligence by NATO from what we know, likely on both the operational and strategic level. This combination should allow them to be able to select when and where to engage the Russian forces. And if the Leopard 1 thermal sites is better than some Russian systems, where it might be best used. Considering that the Ukrainians have achieved various successes with ambushes and special tactics, the Leopard 1 might be better suited for those missions, particularly ones that rely on extended deployment times and less on firepower and armor protection. Additionally, Leopard 1 should be able to destroy tanks from the side, particularly at close distances. Such situations are likely in ambushes, villages and urban combat. These scenarios generally favor the defenders heavily and knowledge of the terrain can also be exploited. Jens Wehner on Twitter also gave a few examples about their potential employment. The Ukrainians could use the Leopard 1A5 on secondary fronts. This would free up more powerful T-64s. He also mentions non-combat deployment. It is also conceivable to use the Leopard 1A5 as a training tank. You could train tank crews and train soldiers against tanks. I drove over soldiers in foxholes to get them used to tanks. Be aware that Jens tweets in German and English, generally he writes the first part of the tweet in German and the translation in English. In terms of training, Jens Wiener noted that about 6 weeks were generally enough to train him as a driver and for the fire control system. Considering the circumstances in Ukraine and likely previous experiences, such training times could probably be reduced. Generally, 6 weeks is a short time period, but depending on the circumstances, it can also be rather long. 
Considering that the invasion started on 24 February, a bit more than seven weeks have passed now. So if Germany had immediately provided fully operational tanks back then, the Ukrainians would have a fully trained crew by now. Yet even if the sale is approved now, Rheinmetall will need several weeks to get them ready for delivery. So we are talking about two months from approval to being combat ready under favorable circumstances. Another issue might be logistics. These tanks need to be maintained and repaired. Keep in mind this tank weighs more than 40 tons. So this is not like a car. There are a lot more forces at work here. As such it would be required to train mechanics and deliver a certain amount of spare parts, also ammunition, as well to keep the tanks operational. There might be also other material like special lubricants, etc. Of course, this also depends on the employment in the Ukrainian armed forces as well. Training and setting up an infrastructure for these 50 or 150 Leopards would make the most sense if Turkey and Greece would subsequently send the Leopard 1s to Ukraine. After all, together they have about 900. Although not sure in what condition they are. Of course, this would again require German approval as outlined in the BMP1 video. To summarize, the question if Ukraine will get Leopard 1s from Germany is hard to answer at this moment. The public opinion is clear in favor of it, yet the diplomatic ramifications should also be considered. About the general assessment, I think Jens Wehner put it best. The tank is outdated but still has fighting power. It has little chance against modern tanks. Tactics are key. I hope you learned something new. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script and providing very good feedback. Thank you to the Panzermuseum Munster and the Tank Museum at Bovington for inviting me in the past years. Special thanks to all my supporters for making trips to museums and the military archives possible. As always, source the list in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.